Okay, and you roll in there? Okay. All right, okay. Well, thank you so much everyone for uh, coming out. Uh, this will be lecture number 13. I hope that's right. I think it's lecture 13 in our uh, short course, A General Introduction to the Bible. And um, why don't we open with a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord for his help here today so, so that we make maximum uh, use of our time together. So let's do that. Okay. Oh, Lord God Almighty, we do thank you, God, for your kindness. We thank you for your precious book, the Bible. And uh, tonight, Lord, we're just a few gathered here to um, give you full attention, to really uh, focus on what you've given us in terms of inscripturated revelation. And we pray for your help, God, for this course. We pray that it's um, truthful, that it's honoring to you, that it's a help to all those who are either watching the videos or listening by MP3 or here in the classroom uh, while this information is being given out. We pray, Lord, that our time here this evening is uh, fruitful, that it's edifying, honoring to you, and um, very encouraging to your people. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's sort of pick up uh, where we left off. Um, and just as an aid to the memory, this course here is, um, we're calling it a general introduction to the Bible. The basic template that we're working from is um, Max Anders' fine approach. He actually wrote a book and then revised that book, 30 Days to Understanding the Bible. And um, he reminds us that the Bible is basically split into two parts. You have an Old Testament, books written, 39 books written before the time of Jesus. And uh, those Old Testament books are divided, organized for you and me, uh, into three different categories. The first batch of books we call the historical books of the Old Testament. And uh, this gives you the origin and uh, early history of mankind, of the world, of the nation of Israel. Very, very important history. Uh, it shows us that God has been acting in the world, divine action in the world. Uh, then the, the second batch of books in the Old Testament are the poetical books. God is still talking to us, uh, but in the poetry books, he's using a different genre to do it. And we said that's, that shows us something very special about God, doesn't it? He's not robotic. He's creative. He has a heart. Uh, he speaks to us in many different ways so that we'll get the message. Uh, and then the last division of books in the Old Testament are the prophetical books. And those are the books that, um, well, those are the books where God has chosen men, prophets, who foretell and foretell. Uh, they declare God's truth. They expose sin and error. They call people back to righteous living. Uh, and they predict the future. And many of those prophecies have been fulfilled down to points. And some are yet to be fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled uh, Every detail will be fulfilled, just as God has predicted and ordained. Okay, so that's the Old Testament. We we're, want to look today at the New Testament. The New Testament uh, is the second division in the Bible. Only 27 books. Some are long, some are short. Uh, the New Testament comprised of 27 books. Old Testament, 39 books. The New Testament, books written at the time of Jesus, or just after Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended into heaven. I happen to think, just as, uh, just as you know, something that you might want to think about and uh, do some research on, I'm convinced that the earliest uh, writing of, of the New Testament, or anything that looks you know, like the New Testament, um, goes back to the days in which Jesus was actually on the earth during, during his earthly ministry. Uh, the early church seemed to think that Matthew was the first guy to write anything, and he was writing right there while Jesus was talking. He was recording the sayings of Jesus. And those sayings later on became incorporated into the Gospel of Matthew, the first of the Gospels to be written. And um, now, of course, that's a minority opinion here, uh, but it's, it is the opinion of the early church, and they are, they're much closer to it than today's liberal scholars. I think you agree, right? So anyhow, the New Testament books uh, divided into also three divisions, just like Old Testament divided into three divisions. 
New Testament books are divided into three divisions too. We have the historical books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the four Gospels. They tell us the story of Jesus, about his pre-existence, his miraculous birth, sinless life, his uh, preaching ministry, his miracle ministry, uh, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to the Father. And the book of Acts picks up right where the Gospels leave off and they tell us about the activities of the early church. How did the early church organize itself? What were, they, what were their activities? How far did they spread? What were they preaching? Did they change their message? How did this work? How did they handle disputes? It's all there in the book of Acts. Okay? So those are the historical books of the New Testament. Uh, and then, then the next batch of books in the New Testament are the epistles. We have Pauline epistles. Those are the epistles written by the great apostle Paul. And then you have general epistles written by other uh, apostles and prophets. So, and those would be the, like the epistle to the Hebrews. James, Peter, John, Jude, they wrote other epistles. But you can see Paul wrote most of them. Um, Paul is an absolutely stupendous figure in the New Testament, in the history of the church. He might be the most godly-minded, successful, powerful, irresistible missionary the world's ever known. And, um, and believe me, this is a real challenge tonight, because as a pastor... I don't want to just give a general introduction to the New Testament. I just want to go off on a tangent <laughs> in every topic that we happen to cover here. And I'm going to try to resist that and just, uh, just make this a basic overview, okay? So uh, let's dive in here to these uh, history books uh, of the New Testament. This is a, a depiction of New Testament chronology, okay? In, in very, very simple form. Basically... Jesus came into the world sometime, most, most scholars want to say around 4 BC. They want to say there was an error in, um, in our calendars. The calendar that we work from today was supposed to be based on when Jesus came into the world. And looking back, many scholars think that there was a, there was a four to six year error introduced. So most scholars want to say that Jesus was born somewhere, somewhere around 4 BC. I sort of doubt it. I think all things considered, he was born closer to 2 BC, 1 to 2 BC. And, um, and that's, that's a discussion for another time. Um, but we say, generally speaking, around AD 0. Well, of course, there was no year 0, but we're just speaking generally. Um, but Jesus was crucified and resurrected somewhere around AD 30. I think, personally, 32. Again, and I have reasons for thinking that. Okay, there's, a, there's a whole political situation there in the world, and it makes sense if, that he was crucified, I think, in 32. And many scholars want, are, are opting for 32 AD. Um, but after Jesus, now, the early church is very, very busy, and uh, the Apostle Paul gets converted, and he's writing letters. And the first, le the first epistle of Paul is the epistle to the Galatians. He wrote that about 48 AD, or AD 48 is, better, is the proper way to say it. Um, some folks disagree. Some folks think that 1 Thessalonians is the first epistle. Some think 1 Corinthians. I think I could probably argue convincingly that it's Galatians. And Max, and this, this chart comes straight out of Max Anders' book, uh, and he agrees. Galatians is the first one. Not that that's a big deal, but I think the chart is accurate. Uh, then you have 1st and 2nd Thessalonians around AD 50, uh, the Corinthian epistles, 53 thereabouts, uh, and then AD 60, see these, in, in 60 AD, Paul's in prison in Rome, his first Roman imprisonment, so he writes Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philemon, and Philippians while he's in prison. Uh, Paul gets out, uh, and he resumes his missionary activities, and then he writes some more letters. And he, those are the pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus. He writes uh, after he's been imprisoned again. And that second imprisonment, Paul doesn't escape. It, not in the flesh, he doesn't. He, he gets his head taken off. And, um, but then he went to be with the Lord. And he, Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is 
gain. Yeah. And his last words on this topic are in 2 Timothy. And he said, there is a crown laid up for me. And, I, and he was happy to see a savior. He said, I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Paul could stretch out a map of, of the ancient Roman world at the end of his life. And he could say, I finished my course. I've told everybody I can reach about Jesus, about the Lord Jesus. And um, we want that testimony, right? Yeah. As far as the uh, general epistles go, uh, we want to say that James was written very early in the 40s. Hard to pinpoint exactly, but probably in the 40s of the first century for James. First and second Peter in the 60s, probably in the 60s. Uh, Hebrew, now he's got Hebrews and Jude around 67. Uh, really hard to know where to put um, to put these guys. I think he's probably right because Jude references the sayings of the apostles. And then next thing you know, he's quoting almost verbatim uh, 2 Peter 3. So we know that Jude knew about 2 Peter. So Jude comes after Peter. So I think the chart is correct there. Uh, Hebrews 67, possibly or possibly earlier because in the book of Hebrews, the writer there is talking about the temple in Jerusalem, it's still standing, and sacrifices are still being offered. There's still a priesthood functioning. And that means that the writer is writing that letter before A.D. 70, when the temple was knocked to the ground, and the, and the sacrificial system was obliterated at that time. Uh, and then he's got 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation in the 90s of the first century, before the end of the first century. Um, I think most mainstream scholarship uh, accepts the dates there on that one. I think it's pretty safe to say that John wrote Revelation at the end of the first century. John was on the island of Patmos, exiled for his faith, uh, under the reign of Domitian. We know when he was reigning. Uh, the early church was unanimous on this, that that's where John was, and that was the time um, where he was exiled. Uh, some folks want to say that Revelation was written before AD 70, and the reason why they're saying that is because all that apocalyptic imagery there in that book, speaking, we think, of the end of the world, they want to say that's all symbolic language pointing to the destruction of Jerusalem. These folks are called preterists, and I am not a preterist. And I think that um, if this was an eschatology course, and, and one day we will run an es eschatology course, I think we could argue cogently that uh, the preterist view is not correct. Revelation is speaking to us of things that are future to our own day. Uh, the apocalyptic imagery there is speaking to us of uh, Daniel's 70th week. The 70th week of Daniel, it's, we, we call that sometimes the Great Tribulation. Jesus called it Tribulation, the Great One. And, and um, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and we know that. Jesus told us that um, in Mark's Gospel, that... It will be a time of tribulation such as the world has never seen, nor, no, nor ever will. Okay, not since the days of the flood, not since the creation. And um, we've seen worse atrocities than AD 70, haven't we? You know, God help us, we have. So, anyway, I didn't mean to go off on a big tangent there. See what I mean? This is hard. <laughs> this is very hard today. Okay, before we get into the historical section of the New Testament, uh, can we have a review here? Do you remember the arc of Bible history? Remember, um, each, each block in our chart is a time block. And, and we call them eras, the eras of Bible history. Now, how many people know what we call that first era? What's that the era of? Creation. Creation and then? Patriarch. Exodus. Exodus. Conquest. They leave Egypt and they conquer the promised land. After they've conquered the promised land, then what does Israel do? Judges, Judges are ruling them. Then? Kingdom. Kings, yeah, or monarchy. It's, that's where Israel, God's people, are ruled by kings. Then comes? Exile. exile. Return, from exile. Return from exile. Silence. And then the silence period. So there we have it. Creation, patriarch, exodus, conquest, judges, kings, Exile, return, and then the silence period, that 400-year period of prophetic silence where God's not writing books anymore between the Old and the New Testaments. 
Okay? Well, we want to get here now into the historical section of the New Testament, and we start with the Gospels era. And this is going to go very, very quick. And I'm going to try to keep it quick. <laughs> okay? The Gospels era. This is what Max Anders says um, in his attempt to synopsize the Gospel era. He says, Jesus comes in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of a Savior and offers salvation and the true kingdom of God. While some accept him, most reject him, and he is crucified, buried, and resurrected. So that's Max Anders' synopsis of the Gospels era. Now, you remember, right, that each era in Bible history, we could break it down into four subdivisions, remember? So, so just as an example, the creation era, we broke that down to what? Creation, fall, flood, and the Tower of Babel. So four divisions, remember? And each of the time blocks, each of the eras, can be broken down into four subdivisions that way. The same holds true with the gospel, Gospels era. We can break down, and it's a very short time block, isn't it? I mean, it's just the life of Jesus. It's the earthly ministry of Jesus. And so we can break that down in summary fashion into four uh, subdivisions. The first subdivision is Christ's early life. So you remember, of course, Jesus is eternal. The Son of God is eternal. But he came into the world at a, at a point in time uh, when he adopted a human nature. So we have the, the second person of the Trinity, now one person with two natures forever, a human nature and a divine nature. Uh, but he comes into the world, a little baby, and you read about that, the, the, um, uh, the nativity narratives in Matthew and Luke. Jesus is miraculously born in Bethlehem, born to uh, Mary and Joseph. Joseph, the adopted father, Mary's a virgin. Um, and you have little snippets of his life. His parents had to whisk him away over to the temple, you know, 40 days after he was born. You know, circumcised, he is um, uh, given the name Jesus in uh, obedience to the angel, Gabriel. Uh, and then he, when he's a little child, he is, receives a visit from wise men from the east. They come to Bethlehem to see him, to worship the king. They know, they know the king has been born. And then when the king, the false king of the Jews, Herod, hears about this, he wants to destroy Jesus and... Mary and Joseph are warned in a dream. Take the, take the child to Egypt. You've got to get out of here. And so they return several years later, and um, they make their home in Nazareth, north of, you know, north of Jerusalem, north of Bethlehem, way in the north in Nazareth. Uh, and that's where he grows up. And we don't learn too much about those years growing up. Uh, one little account, though, in Luke's Gospel, that when Jesus was 12 years old, he and the rest of the family came to Jerusalem and he lingered behind. When it was time to come home, he, there he was found in the temple and he was confounding the religious leaders. At 12 years old, he could ask them hard questions. They're, see, and if you read it, it's, it's very amazing. They're asking him questions and he is astounding them with his answers and the way he's answering in true rabbinic fashion is to ask them questions. And he's really, really distinguishing himself as a, a brilliant, brilliant young man who has some mastery already over the scriptures. It's incredible. Of course, he's the son of God, and in him are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we're not that shocked, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so that's the uh, early life of Jesus. It says that he returned to Nazareth, and he was subject to his parents. He grew up in Nazareth. He didn't go off to India or someplace, Tibet, and study Buddhism and all this other stuff. The text, Luke's very clear. He went to Nazareth, and he, was, he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. That's where, he was, that's where he was raised. And then his early ministry, that's the next subdivision. Uh, remember, Jesus came onto the scene at the age of 30 to begin his earthly ministry with power. Uh, he was baptized in the River Jordan. Uh, he was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tested by Satan, to show to men and angels and to the devil himself that Jesus is impeccable. Impeccable. There's a word for you. It means he cannot sin. It's not that Jesus just displayed 
uh, impressive human resilience. That's not what happened there. It's that Jesus is perfect and cannot sin. He is impeccable. And uh, he didn't eat or drink for 40 days. And Satan tempted him to, to make stones bread. And it said he hungered. But he wasn't about to take orders from a fallen angel. <laughs> Remember that? And um, so he commenced his early ministry. And um, he went around preaching, returning to Jerusalem for the feasts. He performed miracles. In that early ministry, Jesus gained a lot of support. He had thousands of people following him. Thousands of people. And the word was out. We think the Messiah is here. Very, very spectacular ministry. And as we said this morning in the church service, Jesus was, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can say categorically, the most beautiful human being to ever touch the planet. He only ever spoke truth. He only ever did good to people. You know? The most beautiful human being ever. And praise the Lord, you'll see him one day. Your eyes will see him. You can say like Job, one day I'll see him. A beautiful Savior. Um, but in the late, this is our third subdivision, there's a later ministry now. That later ministry, you start to see a decline in Christ's popularity. He is not the Messiah people are looking for. He is the savior of the world. He is here to offer himself a ransom for many. He is here to pay our sin debt with his own blood. Most of the Jews, uh, especially the religious leaders, are not understanding this. You see? And this is God now. This is God behind this. Uh, God is not deceiving people. So important, friends, to understand this. Our God is not deceiving people. He doesn't lie to people. He doesn't play games with people. But... He will send Messiah into the world and he will be everything the, the Bible says he's supposed to be. Um, but people conveniently don't want to read the Bible at face value. They just want it to see the conquering Messiah that's spoken of. They don't want to see the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. They don't want that as their leader, as their Messiah. Some of the people were following Jesus just so that they could get what, get what they could. We read spectacular accounts in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Spectacular accounts of how Jesus could multiply fish and loaves. A couple little fish and a few small loaves of bread, and Jesus could, could feed and fill thousands of people. And it's a very beautiful account, isn't it? Like uh, Matthew 14 and so on. But John's gospel gets us a little more detail. In John, the sixth chapter, you read most of those people who, re who were recipients of that miracle, they were, they were only following Jesus so they, they could get something from him. They had no comprehension that they had a sin debt that needed to be atoned for. And so Jesus taught them a hard, a hard lesson. He said, you're going to need to eat my flesh and drink my blood, or you'll n you won't see the kingdom. And of course, he's speaking metaphorically. He doesn't mean you actually have to engage in something gross like cannibalism. And we know that, right? Because Jesus said in that same chapter, the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. He says, whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. And we know that he's talking about coming to him and believing in him, not actually eating his flesh. But the people, those self-serving, self-seeking people... They didn't understand. And they wouldn't draw close to Jesus to get an explanation. They said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And he lost a good deal of his following that afternoon. Right there. And, and that marks the decline. You start to see the decline in his popularity. And finally, subdivision number four is his death and resurrection. Uh, the religious leaders so misunderstood him. They were so envious of him. Uh, that they uh, basically orchestrated, organized a judicial murder of Jesus. That's what you could call it. They had him arrested, trumped up charges, false witnesses, and uh, he was brought before Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, and um, a pressure was applied to Pilate. You don't crucify this man. You're no friend of Caesar. You understand from, 
from uh, history outside the New Testament, contemporaneous history, that uh, the political situation, situation was such that Pilate really did fear for his life. Uh, he was being watched by the emperor. Uh, and, and he didn't want to make a false move here. So uh, basically, he gave in. He didn't want another uprising. He didn't want complaints to the emperor. And he gave in. He, he saw to it that Jesus was crucified. And of course, Acts chapter 2 says, this is all ordained of God. People took with lawless hands, they crucified the Lord of glory, the Prince of life. They crucified him. Um, but uh, Acts 2.24, I think it is, says, the pangs of death couldn't hold him. Easter's coming up. We're thinking about the resurrection. The pangs of death couldn't hold him. You know what that means? Uh, there's some mothers here. When you feel birth pangs, what does that mean? It means baby's coming. Can you stop it? No way. <laughs> you can't stop it. Death couldn't hold Jesus. The pangs of death couldn't hold him. He was coming out of that tomb, and he did. In, with a glorified, resurrected, wonderful body, fit for heaven, eternally now, and with a body that you're going to receive one day. Paul says it, right? Philippians chapter 3. And so if we were to sort of just summar, summarize or synopsize the Gospels era, we can say the Gospels speak of Christ's pre-existence in early life, his early ministry in which he gained popularity through his preaching and miracles, his later ministry in which his popularity was in the decline, and then his uh, death and victorious resurrection from the dead. And Jesus, I'll just remind us, is the first fruits. He is the first fruits of them that slept. That means, friends, more is coming. He's not the only one in all history to come out of the tomb with a glorified, resurrected body. He's the first one. There are, there are no others so far, but there will be. There will be multitudes, an innumerable company of born-again, redeemed, glorified saints. One day, and we get to join in that company too. That's the promise of the gospel, right? Yes, yes. Well, I'm tempted just to stop it right there. Are there any questions? I think it's a good place to just think about that resurrection before we take our break. But are there any questions or comments about anything that we looked at so far? In our, in our, maybe throughout the entire course, you may have questions about something that we... Go ahead, Danny boy, but it better not be hard. No, <laughs> okay. Okay. What does AD stand for? Mm. Thank you. I think I can answer that one. <laughs> Our calendars are divided into BC and AD. You, we often hear about things that happened in the year 400 and something BC, right? So basically, our calendar is split in two, sort of like the Bible is split in two before Jesus, after Jesus. Well, um, that split is because of the Lord. So we live in the year 2017, A.D. 2017. It means Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. That's Latin, the year of the Lord. B.C., uh, before Christ. Okay? Now, people react to this. Right? In the not-too-distant past, people react in the 20th century. They reacted. They say, well, we don't like this. 1985 A.D., let's change that. So now everything that used to be called A.D. is now C.E., Common Era. It's, not, it's no longer the year of our Lord. Now it's 2017 in, of the Common Era. And we say B.C.E. now, before the Common Era. It's so artificial. It's, it's so stupid. It's trying to get our mind off of Jesus. But if anyone would ask, you know, oh, before the common era and after the common era, or, you know, common era, well, that's supposed to have us not think about the Lord. But if anyone thinks about it for two seconds, why this division? What caused that division, anyhow? The Lord Jesus, the coming of Jesus. And if I can just mention it, if you go to the Human Rights Museum here in Winnipeg, it's stupendous architect, architecture. It's, it's really... And, and the Human Rights Museum is there for a good purpose, I think. There is such a thing as human rights. Of course, secularism can't account for these things. Only God can. Um, but it, it's not a waste of time to have a display 
that celebrates human rights. But if you go into that museum, you're going to see a big, long, elaborate timeline. And on the timeline, you have dates. And underneath those dates, or above them, I can't remember, I think it's just underneath, you have faces of different men of history, men and women of history, important people, right? And who, who is depicted amongst all those important people? Well, Jesus of Nazareth is in there. And they are doing their very best to hide him in obscurity. You've got Muhammad, and you've got Gandhi, and you've got Plato and Aristotle, and this, that, and the other. And, and, then, oh, and then there's Jesus, and, the, and just, he's just one of many, right? The problem is they've got dates on that thing. And right above this picture depicting the Lord is an arrow. He's the dividing line, right? Before the common era, after the common era. And it takes not an ounce of philosophical sophistication or discernment to realize there's something special about that one. He split history right in two. Isn't it amazing? You, Jesus doesn't touch something and um, leave it the same as it was before. He didn't touch history and leave it the same as it was before. He won't touch your life and leave you the same. Thank the Lord. Praise God, right? Yeah. Well, um, with that, that brings us to 30 minutes. And we'll take our 10-minute break. And then we'll, uh, we'll pick it up right there, okay? All right.